Uh, welcome, everyone. For those of you who haven't met me before, although I know some of you have, my name is Kevin Fleming. I manage software development teams at Digium. Digium is the company that was the original creator of Asterisk, and we're still the sponsor of the uh, open source Asterisk project, and also do commercial Asterisk things and lots of other interesting stuff. So, so I'm here today to talk about uh, what people do with Asterisk in terms of clustering it for providing services of various different kinds. Um, so I guess we'll start with, first of all, how many of you know what Asterisk is? Yay, that's a good turnout. That's better than a couple years ago. Uh, how many of you already use Asterisk uh, in a significant way? Wow, almost everybody that's here. Oh, you don't need this then. I can just go. <laughs> so, all right. Well, one of the things that's become um, really uh, apparent over the last couple years as users Okay, screensaver, I'll watch for that. Um, as users like this community, as opposed to small business users, have begun using Asterisk, is that it's obviously useful as much more than just a small business phone system, which was its original intent. And so there's lots of really interesting things that are being done with it. Uh, one really cool one, which I'm going to be talking about in the next session that I'm also a part of, um, of mashing Asterisk with other technologies. So what we'll do here is we'll talk a little bit about Asterisk itself, for those of you who don't know the entire background of it, I won't spend a whole lot of time on it. Um, most people here already knew what Asterisk was, so I assume you already know that it's open source, licensed under the GPL version 2. Uh, in, we primarily run on Linux, that's what we do the bulk of our development on, although it also runs on Solaris and Mac OS X, and uh, as of our development version, actually runs on Windows now as well, um, which someone from the community contributed. So, but for those of you who haven't really worked a lot with open source uh, technologies, these are pretty much the bullet points of why you might want to consider doing that. Um, it, it, there's a lot more to it than just the fact that you might have something available to you that isn't available in a commercial piece of software. There are, you know, for lack of a better way to say it, political reasons and economical reasons and lots of other reasons that you may want to consider using open source software. But some of these are really, really important. Um, and especially in the uh, voice communications world, we're seeing commercial companies producing products with more and more and more complicated features. And one of the big differences between commercial product development and open source product development is how those features arrive. Um, in the open source world, features get put into the product because someone actually needs it. Whether that's someone out in the community that develops it, someone that contacts us and says, hey, I wish this was there, or whatever. That's not always the case in the commercial world, and in a lot of cases, you'll receive uh, you know, a new version of some product that you bought that claims to have 600 new features, and you look at them and you go, I can't figure out what any of these are for or what I would do with any of these. That tends to not be the case so much in the open source world. Certainly, there's a lot of esoteric things that get put in there. But in great many cases, the things that get added are things that you would want to use because you are a user of the product. And the other thing that is a big differentiator between open source development and non-open source development, even if the software is not freely licensed, there are open source products out there that are not free to use, but the source is available. There are many, many, many more people looking at the code, looking at the new features that get added and the code that gets written, watching for security problems, watching for bugs, and lots of other things. As an example, um, we currently have probably, I would say, somewhere between 40 and 50 people who regularly contribute code to Asterisk. That's either people that we employ to do that or people from the community that are contributing code. They may be employed to write that code or they may just be people that are volunteering or whatever. But in spite of the fact that there's about 50 active developers, there are about 4,000 people that read our development mailing list and pay attention to all the things that we're talking about, about what we're going to do and why we're going to do them and get their input. And even more interestingly than that, there are over 1,000 people that read the mailing list that just echoes out all the code changes that we make. So every time we make a change in the code of asterisk, that change gets sent out to a variety of different mailing lists for people to watch. And there are a thousand people that just pay attention to the code changes that we make, which means that it's rare that, well, it's not rare that a developer makes a stupid mistake. All of us make stupid mistakes, myself included. It's rare that it gets to survive more than a few minutes. 
because someone out there, one of those thousand people is going to look at that and go, hey, wait a minute, that's really stupid. Did you sure you want to do that? And we go fix it. So what that does is improves the quality of the software more quickly and fewer bugs get live on to actually be released. Another area that a lot of people are not aware of, again, because they think asterisk is a, a PBX or even that open source telephony can be used only to build PBXs, we can actually do a lot of different things, and especially in the markets of enterprises and carriers where they have existing telephony networks they're just trying to add functionality onto. That's one of the areas that this can be used for. This is a way to get this technology into your network and use it for different pieces of functionality. In actuality, there are some errors on this, uh, on this graph because there's actually a company out there that has asterisk running inside a SIP phone now. Um, I'm not really sure exactly why they did it other than just a proof of concept that they could do it. So literally, it can be everywhere now. Every, almost every, I can't put it inside an analog phone, but you know, analog phones don't have processors and memory, so that's, uh. all right. So I mentioned some of this before, just a little bit of background on the project. Um, to date, Asterisk has received contributions from over 400 people from um, pretty much every continent except Greenland and Antarctica. We don't know that we've gotten any contributions from either of those but every other one. And the interesting thing is that even though um, Asterisk has matured quite a lot, does what a lot of people want it to do, and that we as a company behind it now employ a lot of developers working on it, when we do a major release, there is still somewhere between half and two-thirds of what's new in there in terms of new functionality, not bug fixes and, and improvements in the code, that actually came from the open source community, which means the product is still evolving along the lines of what the users want, not what some marketing department or other you know, or corporate organization has decided the product should become. I get the pleasure of working at Digium between those two camps. I get to be the border between the open source camp and the marketing department that says asterisk should be this, and I say nobody in the open source community cares about that. It's a really fun part of my job. So I mentioned this before, I won't spend too much time on this. Um, we now have 12 people that spend all of our time working on Asterisk development. And our focus now, because Asterisk has matured so much and has so much functionality, is on core functionality, improving the core of the product, making it more efficient, making it more scalable, making it more reliable, all the things that play into obviously building clusters around Asterisk and using it for providing services. And we're also now starting to spend a lot of time on integration with third-party commercial products. Three, two or three years ago, uh, there was no opportunity to use Asterisk with commercial speech recognition engines, for example. There is now in commercial text-to-speech engines, the same thing. Those are areas where the open source community hasn't produced something that's really usable in a production-grade scenario yet to do those pieces of functionality. So we have spent the time and money and effort to integrate asterisk with existing commercial products, which means you get to use that functionality in your network.